to win at digital distribution. I was trying for a viral title there. If you guys want to tweet that out, then that's great. I know Brad, our moderator, is very much a social media guru as well. So we'll probably be live tweeting on stage. It's quite amazing to watch him handle the panel and handle the audience and handle his phone at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's quite a pleasure, quite a thrill. All right, so today we're going to be looking at different strategies for discoverability, monetization. We're going to talk about audience engagement with the end user. We're going to talk about content and how it's increasingly created for digital first. And definitely, most certainly, about the new transactional life cycles of content. Uh, leading us today is Brad Pellman, our moderator. He's the CEO of the Fremantle Corporation, but many of you will know him because he's been quite an industry staple in the distribution world here in Canada. Uh, as the previous co-founder and co-president of Maple Pictures, also having worked uh, with Pelman Corp, well, it is not having, but is still, yep, Pelman Corporation, which is his own consultancy, um, which is involved in a number of startups for digital and traditional content initiatives, uh, specializing in program distribution and marketing strategies. So a wealth of knowledge, and definitely, if anyone can lead this work, cohort of experts, it would be Brad. So please help me welcome Brad Hellman and the guests for How to Win a Digital Distribution. Thanks to TFA District for inviting me back and uh, welcome my esteemed panel. Um, usually I'll, I just like to start to poll the room because it's important for us uh, as we're sharing some knowledge just to find out who we're talking to. So just by a show of hands, filmmakers in the room. And uh, on the uh, creative type directors, writers, okay? And uh, anybody in the distribution sector presently, okay? And uh, any um, DOP uh, behind the camera kind of uh, situation, just a few, very good. Okay, well, so that gives us a, a pretty good indication as to how to direct our conversation. And uh, just by way of introduction, we'll go across. Um, the uh, stage here to uh, my right, my friend Eric Stein. Um, Eric, why don't you give us uh, just a, a bit of a bio and tell us where you're coming from today. Absolutely, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, hashtag winning is how you should present it, because we're winning here, this is, we're winning digital distribution. Uh, so my name is Eric Stein, I run a company called Impact Global Media. We are a digital consulting firm helping companies navigate the digital distribution transition in media. And that is massive. So there's a lot of companies really looking to uh, make changes and shift accordingly from the traditional forms of distribution to new media or digital distribution. That includes distribution companies, content providers, technology providers, etc. cetera. Uh, and I work with them on high level strategy as well as business development and implementation. How's that? That was great. Yeah. We're going to ask you about what all that means <laughs> as this goes on. Don't ask. Okay. Um, Yolanda Macias from Synodyme, next to Eric. Why don't you give us a brief as to what you're up to? I'm Yolanda Macias. I work for Synodyme. I head up acquisitions and digital distribution. We're a full service distribution company. So we will, we will acquire content, television series, films, and distribute it in any way that we see the end user wants to engage with that piece of content. So that's through theatrical, uh, digital, television, and yes, even DVD still exists. And, um, and then we also just recently began launching our own digital networks. Um, and today we announced on, with USA the Dev Network, and we'll get, we can get into that. Fantastic, yeah, we'll definitely get into that. And next to Yolanda is Sheila Andreen, the CEO and co-founder of IndieFlix. Hi, thank you for having me and thanks for being here. I am a filmmaker and I started IndieFlix back in 2005 with 36 titles, DVD on demand, because I didn't like how distribution worked. I felt there were too many middlemen middle and not enough transparency and reporting. So we started with 36 titles, we now have 8,200 titles. We stream globally, including Cuba and China. We're on iOS, Fire TV, and we're continuing to grow, grow on more devices. We pay filmmakers for every minute watched, and uh, Variety calls us the Netflix of independent film. Fantastic. Well, we're going to get into that also. And then Michael Murphy from Gravitas Ventures at the very end. There is. So Michael Murphy, I'm the president of Gravitas Ventures. We are a film distribution company. Uh, all rights with a focus on video on demand. 
Uh, next year will be our 10th year of operation. Um, we release a lot of movies, uh, north of 300 films a year. Of those, probably 20 have some kind of theatrical component, and probably about four dozen we're releasing kind of globally, um, or some subset thereof. Um, and the world's changing every single day. So, interesting spot. Well, change is definitely the order of the day. And let me start with just sort of paint, let, let me paint a picture, because it'll help kind of take us into this next venture. So, I'm of the older generation where I still remember what a video store was to, to the consumer and to the community that we lived in. And it was almost a habitual thing, whether it was on vacation or whether it was just a Friday night with a date or your buddies or whatever, that you would go to the video store, you would have very little idea as to what you wanted uh, to rent. Um, you knew maybe that there was something new out because you had heard from friends. Um, but you went into the store and you saw thousands of video boxes and you didn't really uh, have an intent as to what you wanted to get, but you went to the new release section, you walked up and down the aisle. You might have picked something because what you were intending wasn't there. Um, but it was that tap on the shoulder from your neighbor or from somebody that you know shops at that same store that just volunteers the fact that he or she just watched that and it was great. And that was the decision that you needed to go to the retail uh, till and throw your five bucks down and off you went for two days and maybe got charged a late fee because you couldn't get back on Monday. Um, that's the basis for which Netflix was created to avoid the late fee. And that is the basis for which the digital on-demand world is really now trying to serve. But the, the hypothesis is there are now more digital outlets in the marketplace um, th that, that are not as effective at helping you as the consumer decide what it is you want to watch or help you curate um, the, the goal at which you went out that Friday night to get it in the first place. Um, I also, you know, sitting in front of a large screen television with a Netflix or an Apple TV uh, search engine in front of me, you find yourself searching through it and yet not finding anything and how often have you ever not watched anything as a result. So this is the environment that we're in and I kind of harken back to the days when the video store kind of made it, you never, you rarely walked out of the video store without something. But I think today, our biggest challenge from a discoverability perspective, and I know Eric just moderated a panel yesterday on what it means to market feature film today in this new digital environment, there's a lot more questions than answers. So I think just as a basis of, of construction, let's just go across and talk about what each of you guys are trying to do to deal with the discoverability question, and you know, helping your suppliers find an audience in the marketplace. I, I just got this image of binging on the selection, right? Either you're, you're like binging on the selection, we've all had that experience where you're looking through and there's hundreds of thousands of titles and you have to commit to one uh, to watch because ideally, I guess, you have picture in picture, you could watch two at the same time. Um, that's very bingy. Anyway, you know, discoverability is crucial. It's really important. Um, and I would say in terms of nurturing a community and starting to think about what your film or your product uh, is in terms of an audience is, is really important. So nowadays, uh, you know, 2,000 titles in a blockbuster versus hundreds of thousands uh, of titles online, uh, the consumer has to have relevance. So there has to be some way to reach the consumer and stand out in the crowd. Uh, and so to do that, oftentimes within uh, the new media, new media ecosystem, there are cost-effective ways to nurture the community and bring them along during the process. Oftentimes it's during the development of the film. Um, leading up to the release, at the release date, and then once it's available, uh, you know, uh, click to buy. So uh, I think, you know, companies and filmmakers are becoming a lot more innovative as to uh, the different ways in which to, to capture the consumer um, in a sea of just fragmentation. There are so many services, so many films, uh, and so many different platforms that you know, everybody's all over the place. Eventually, it will start to consolidate. Uh, eventually, in the living room, you will have the linear cable. You'll have the ad-supported YouTube-type services. You'll have the transactional uh, Apple service. You'll have the subscription services like Netflix and Hulu and Show Me. 
uh, etc. So um, that day is coming. We are not there yet. So right now, you may access one uh, or several of those services on your mobile device, some in your living room. Uh, we're a complete mess as an industry. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> How many Canadians are in the room that either work with a Bell or a Rogers or a Shaw if you're from out west? Very few. Okay. I'll try to keep the Canadian context very limited because uh, most of the people, well, I'll, I'll, I can I can help educate it with respect to the cord cutting discussion that is going on in the industry. But let's just finish up with across the board and sort of go to Yolanda and how does Synodyne deal with this sort of discoverability and servicing the community of your viewers? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and we, as a distributor, we're an aggregator. So we have 30,000 pieces of content that we're distributing digitally, um, 50,000 if you include the physical rights. So the discoverability and being able to break through that clutter is of the utmost importance. Plus, we're bringing in 15 to 20 new titles every month. So for it to, to be able to stand out, we have to rely on our customers. We have to rely on you know, Amazon or retail or on um, VOD for those folders, for the um, algorithms to be effective. But what we as a distributor have, have um, found most recently is that when we truly understand how our end user prefers to engage with content, um, which so that means we need to be as ubiquitous as possible. We need to make sure that that content's available so that when it is discovered and you go to your tablet or your living room experience, the content is there. Many times I'll hear about a piece of content and I'll hear about a film that I want to see and I'll go onto my um, VOD um, service provider and I can't find it. And then I start, I have to then search for it, right? So we need to make it convenient for all of you to see it and find it and engage with it. And to do that, um, we've relied recently and have seen very favorable results with social media, but specifically talent, talent activating their social media. Um, so when we get, when we're negotiating to distribute a film, we always ask, um, is the talent willing to promote using their own assets? And we then help them to give the right call to action so that when the release date hits or when it's going to hit, they're sending out tweeting or on their Facebook um, how they can access the content. On, on that point, very quickly, yeah. I've heard uh, cases where producers are starting to contractually obligate talent to, and so wanting to do it and saying they'll do it is one thing. We've seen cases, I was at Warner Brothers for seven years, we watched talent say that they were interested in promoting, and then when the time came, they were busy. Mm -hmm. And so I know uh, Michael can speak to this at Gravitas. They started contractually obligating uh, talent to, when they take on a film, to, to I don't know if you uh, require certain amount of tweets or, or et cetera, but um, to, to promote the film. Why don't we go to Michael, just so, so he sort of handed the segue to you there. Sure. I'll get to Shilla in a second. And, and it's a, I mean, it's a tricky legal question to, to you know, force someone to do something, but you include it, absolutely. And I mean, I can, um, Good faith efforts, and, and generally they want to do it if, if they want to support it. But you know, to your point about discoverability, uh, there are video stores, and they're just digital now. And so you're not walking into the blockbuster, but you're looking at. Uh, and I'm going to use all these terms; they're all synonymous. So you'll hear them: the guide, the GUI, the guide user interface, the user interface, the digital video store. And it's incumbent upon a distributor to intimately know every single guide out there. And it's difficult because there's over 100 cable operators in North America. And each one has a slightly different guide. And really, um, at the end of the day, you know, your films, you're going to win if your film's in the right spot. And it's not easy to get there in some cases. It's easier for some platforms. Docs might go here. Horror does better here. Um, but that's really what you have to do. And um, you have to really know where to ask for. And, Here's the primary ask, here's the secondary ask, here's the tertiary ask, and uh, you know, that's what we're doing. But to the talent piece, I mean, you know, um, as you were, sometimes it's pay to play with some of these customers, sometimes it's executive to executive level lobby. And if I, as a distributor, I'm able to go to an iTunes and I can say, hey, look at this uh, actor who has tweeted about the availability of the film specifically on Apple iTunes with the link. You know, we're helping our customer Apple they're more inclined to say, hey, you know, thanks for pushing people our way, and then, yeah, we'll give you that spot that you, you need. So that's really where it can make an impact. Also, I mean, you can have people just convert right on that tweet, 
you know, they don't click right in and they can buy, but so it's kind of a double pronged approach. Okay, that's good. And Schiller, you guys have been around actually a very long time in this digital, you know, uh, opportunity slash wasteland, depending on which way we're looking at it. How have you survived so long? And how have you sort of connected with your independent filmmaker um, and convinced them that Indieflix is the right uh, platform for them? Do I get to answer the discovery question? Of course. Too? Um, I'm just kind of giving you the, you, you know, you've got the, run with it for you've got the longevity um, that, that, that I We have been around for a long time. Yeah. I'm actually um, a lot younger. I just look this old. Um, <laughs> my daughter used to say, Mom, you should frame your to-do lists because I do so much in a day, you know, raise $30,000 to pay for this or whatever. Uh, we've been bootstrapped. You know, we, we're DVD on demand. We've survived three different technologies. But we've always continued to grow. I think the I connect with the filmmakers because I am a filmmaker. I it's it's where I'm most comfortable. I'm up here with distributors. I'm like the Sesame Street. Like one of those things is not like the other. I'm always the outlier. I'm always the one talking to the girls, bringing in the coffee in the green room. I've never really been in the in the mix. It's it's actually it's okay. I'm used to it. But um, we have. I think we're just a movement. You know, we've never really had enough money to market, but that's all changing, which is great. Um, and I do want to address the discoverability thing. I hate search and discovery. It feels like work for me. I sit there and go to Netflix and flip through their UI, and I can't, you know, find a few things. But once I'm done, I can't find anything else to watch. I can't find anything on Comcast. I even tried CenturyLink, which I'm going, I'm getting off of that. I'm on Amazon. I'm on Hulu. I'm on everything because I have to for my job, and I can't find anything. So I. Pivoted IndieFlix in 2013 to become a subscription-based streaming service. It's $5 a month, $50 annual. Before that, we were DVD and pay-per-view. We did some aggregating. That's how we know each other. All of it just had a lot of middlemen in there, and it just felt like I couldn't track it all. It was just I couldn't rely on anything, and it was too much waiting around. I got bored. So we started to amass a lot of films from 85 countries and 2,500 film festivals, and we work with the top film schools. And now we have channels, and we're working with the film festivals, and we're working with distributors, and we're creating channels for them. And so now we're able to stream globally. So actually, we have some meat. We have something to play with. So we've started to, um, we've got a new technology that we're launching. It's so fun. One of my young developers created it specifically for me as a tool. But what it is, it's called IndieFlix Quick Pick, and it's like Tinder meets Pandora. And basically, is anyone here? Familiar with Tinder and Pandora? I'm not no, on. No one will admit to being familiar with Tinder. I've seen most of you on Tinder. <laughs> so basically, you can say there's a very, very raw version of it up on on IndieFlix right now. But you basically can say, I have 10 minutes. I'm with my family, and I feel like we feel like laughing. And it, we've curated 15 second clips, multiple clips from all of the films, and it'll bring those films up and immediately start playing. It's a swiping motion. No, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. Up. Oh. That looks interesting, but maybe for later, so you swipe down, it goes into your queue. And then you see something that looks interesting, you watch it, and then you're like, this is amazing. You'll now be able to share it with anyone in the world, whether they have an IndieFlix account or not, provided that film has worldwide rights, which we actually have worldwide rights on 85% of our library. So now you can share it with people, so we're cultivating a culture of peer-to-peer -peer curation, which I think is gonna bring down our churn, bring down our cost per acquisition, and make a longer, you know, lifetime value will be longer. So I think that um, those things are really exciting to me. What I love about IndieFlix Quick Pick is that it caters to your mood, and it's got some analytics and some intelligence underneath it, which is going to start learning what you're swiping and keeping and watching and sharing. And so it's the reason, like, that I've ended up watching a lifetime movie, which I would not have, like, set out to watch, or watching something that I would have never dreamed of watching, but it was maybe not good, but engaging. So that's something that's exciting to me, and filmmakers are paid for every minute watched. Right. So. That, I mean, that's a very you know interesting model. That's obviously very uh, corollary to to the Netflix model on a subscription basis. Can can it be successful being independent all the time, and can you get enough content to sort of sustain a, a you know growth uh, pro, pro, you know projections that you guys want to achieve? Yes. Um, you know, we're getting more and more marquee titles. We're signing with much, much bigger distributors. We're starting to get. Well, the nice thing is, is that we also share analytics. So you can go to a dashboard on the back end, and you can see 24-7 how
how many minutes watched, where in the world, in January you will be able to see on what device, so you'll actually know where your audience is. You don't get that with Netflix or Amazon. You don't know where your audience is. You're paid out over eight quarters. I mean, we are, we'll pay 50, you have to hit a $50 minimum threshold. We pay out quarterly, but you can see everything and pretty soon. You know, when you know where your audience is, you, you'll be able to cater to that audience. So you're not just blind with it. Um, we also, having the film schools is really exciting. You know, we have all the major films, like the ones in the country, and then we're expanding globally. We also sell the IndieFlix annual license to the public libraries in the world. We're in nine countries and 1,200 physical library spaces. So the users that come in through the libraries, while they get a free account and can only access a certain amount of the library, they're watching other content that the normal, you know, not normal, but the users that come in through the main portal, they watch completely different stuff. So we're getting web series, we've opened it up for independently produced television, and now we're starting to localize. We'll be making an announcement to, we're localizing in Brazil and Italy, and then we're looking to also expand and tropicalize. Uh, and, and we talked sort of before we sat down with, with uh, to, to discuss sort of how we wanted this conversation to go, we talked about the exclusive, um, issue, content that is only available to certain platforms exclusively, whether it's a Netflix situation where they are producing it and making it available for their subscribers worldwide. What's sort of everybody's take on, on your own platform's exclusivity and maybe just sharing with the, the audience where, you know, that, how that strategy is going to work, you know, for perhaps the filmmakers in the room. Do you, do you want to start again, Eric? You the kind digital of give us distributors, a nice... I'll keep it brief. Yeah. The digital distributors are trying to differentiate themselves and trying to define their consumer base. And so they are investing heavily in original content. And sometimes that's production, sometimes that's co-production, sometimes that's acquiring exclusives. I think that makes for a very nice environment for content producers, right? Because it's more outlets that are you know, buying or co-producing, uh, et cetera. So I think there is a period of time to really take advantage of that. Um, you know, there are so many players in the space and continue to be more, uh, which is which is a good thing. But again, going back to the fragmentation issue that I mentioned prior. Okay, and Yolanda, this the, your relationship with Dove now kind of gives you the other side of it. The other side of it, yeah. but it, it, the, these movies that are made with the Dove sort of stamp of approval um, are are these the ones that would normally. Um, uh, broadcast first and then go into the Synodon digital uh, distribution realm after the fact or explain to us how how this is going to make uh, yeah, so there's a your community a little more involved. I think involved. you're touching on um, original programming versus exclusivity. Um, so, uh, you know, we, Synodon decided in addition to being a full service distribution company that we do believe that the future of digital consumption, at least millennials, um, is for cutting. Uh, not shaving cutting, and we have launched um, our own channels. So we launched Docurama for the enthusiasts of documentaries. We launched um, Con TV for Comic Con um, uh, fans, the fandom, and we, in that case, we uh, partnered with Wizard World, which was on the, the Comic Cons across the nation. And then today, we um, are launching the Dub Network. The Dove channel, which uh, is family friendly, faith friendly content that is Dove approved. So, by um, since we this is day one, um, the content that's on the, the service um, has been licensed and was most likely available elsewhere. There's one um, property, Ostentatious, which is an, an exclusive or an original, and we'll have it for a period of time before it's available anywhere else. But that is a way to differentiate it. When we sell to a Netflix or an Amazon and they want exclusivity, you know, we have to weigh if, if it makes sense. We understand from their perspective, and we understand it as, a dig, as the owner of digital networks. But in some cases, a filmmaker, it's really important for them to, especially in documentaries, for the message to get um, as, uh, as widely viewed as possible. And so then there's a, there's a conversation to have. Um, you know, there's, there's money, and then there's um, the mission behind the film. And, um, but from, from a Dove perspective, as well as Comic-Con, original content is important. Um, because it's not just the exclusive nature, it's that you need to bring in an experience to that channel. Why would I want to pay $5 a month? Why can't I, ju can I just already get that through Netflix and maybe HBO? So you really need to find, that's what I like about IndieFlex, what you just said, you could create an experience for that um, end user. And that's what Con TV does. 
where it's an extension. You can't go to the Comic Cons, but you'll be able to 24 seven be able to view it. So we're doing live streaming from the conventions. Um, with Dove, we'll do original content that is Dove. We'll still get the Dove stamp of approval, but it will be original and exclusive. Got it. Michael, where does uh, Gravitas Ventures and the, this whole process fall into your day to day? I mean, with respect to exclusives, I think you have to talk about what right you're talking about. So, if it's transactional video on demand rental and, and EST sell through, um, generally you, you don't want to do anything exclusive. You go as far and wide as possible to platforms that make sense and let the consumer decide where they want to go watch it, whether they're going to watch it on Rogers or Comcast or Apple or Google Play, let them decide what device and how to watch it and generally make it available you know, simultaneously, um, either domestically or, or worldwide. And it depends on, on the rights. In some cases, you know, there's some interesting things going on with platforms that want to launch and again, if they want to pay enough money for the exclusivity, then maybe it makes sense to do it. Um, again, you have to talk to, you know, your licensor, your filmmaker, producer and see what their um, goals are kind of at the outset and set expectations. Um, in that next window, um, which was the you know, pay one or, or television uh, subscription video on demand, it used to be a lot easier to do non-exclusive licenses across the board. Um, but as some of those platforms have matured and, and, and you know, figured out their strategy, um, they're going to ask for exclusivity. And if it's a good piece of content, uh, you're going to expect to get a few exclusive offers. So we'll just see kind of how they come in and how long they are exclusive. It might be a short period of exclusivity followed by uh, a television window. Maybe it goes dark. There's all kinds of things you can do um, to kind of negotiate those deals out. You know, really what you're trying to do is, is keep an eye on windows to make sure that you're monetizing the film the best you can in each window. Okay. Um, let me turn to the audience just to see if there are any burning questions after the first sort of half hour we've created. Some context, there's a young lady over here on my left. Do we have a mic that, uh, that we can get up to the audience? Why don't you stand up and kind of project? Hi, thank you. Um, uh, Eric, you mentioned um, cost-effective creative ways to score discoverability. I was wondering if you had any specific suggestions you could share with us. Yeah. I, uh, um, Recognizing that perhaps some of the folks here were in my panel yesterday, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but obviously grassroots opportunities in tech with technology have made it quite cost effective to build a community, i.e. Facebook, i.e. the blogosphere, i.e. just researching the online communities. Um, oftentimes someone will come to me with a film and we'll talk about what is the film about, right? And who are the consumers who might be interested? And at the heart of it, you know, give me a topic and I will show you 50 websites and a community that are devoted to that topic. Um, and, and, you know, beyond the broad, you know, being human or, you know, there are, uh, even uh, when you drill down into the niche, um, don't downplay a topic that's in your, in your film. So, you know, if a lot of it, the main character plays tennis, you know, you can go out to those tennis communities. It's, it's a... You know, think of those communities and enthusiasts as potential buyers, and you can really start to build uh, what would be a, a sell sheet that represents what the audience is, not just you know an indie film uh, viewer, uh, but, but also someone who watches tennis, who is a teen girl, who uh, you know, likes X, Y, and Z, depending on what the film is. Anyone else want to add to that from your perspective or general agreement? Okay. In, in agreement on, on all things, I mean, it's important to build community as early as possible. I mean, when we look at films to acquire films, it, I've never heard of the film before, which is frequent, uh, but they've got 30,000 likes on Facebook or they've got a significant number of Twitter followers. It's like, we'll pick up this film. We'll figure out a way to engage that community. And uh, you know, there's things you can do doling out kind of little exclusive clips in exchange for emails. You want to be able to let them know when the film's available. Um, you want to be able to have the film, you know, it's kind of goofy. It's pre-sale for digital. It's not going to run out of digital copies, but pre-sales are interesting. Um, they can help drive the queue, and then it can help the distributor's conversation with that customer. So it's not just Michael Murphy, uh, you know, calling up uh, whoever's merchandising XYZ platform. Say, hey, this movie's really great. Say, this movie's really great. Look at the number of pre-orders we already have, and showing them 
from the beginning that it's not just me. Here's empirical evidence that you ought to, you know, think, you know, that, that where you're going to put this film. Yeah. Absolutely. And and again, I guess I guess generally speaking, the the question as to who you're making this film for should still be the first principle as to why you in the filmmaker community bother uh, to go about it in the first place. Um, there's a question in the back. Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> I just uh, can express a frustration here. Sure. Um, so I, I work with a lot of independent filmmakers, and, um, and and what I hear the panel saying is is what I'm experienced with experiencing, which is you know that uh, the distributors can't market individual titles. There's too many titles. They have an algorithm, algorithms. They have uh, people on staff who do you know the the social media, uh, but there's no budgets and there's no there's no marketing of individual titles. Um, so, um, it, how do I mean? Is that are the distributors giving up on marketing individual titles? What what, what can we expect in the future from uh, the distributors? Okay, Thanks. Eric. One one trend that we're seeing in the transition from traditional distribution to digital distribution is that the entire supply chain is getting involved in the build up to the marketing of the release. So the olden days, the direct to consumer distributor was kind of quote unquote responsible for uh, uh, marketing the film or films to the consumer directly. And nowadays, it's taking uh, a village or the entire supply chain uh, to, to really um, provide outreach. And that comes down to the cast tweets, that comes down to the aggregators, the distributors, um, the filmmakers, the producers, you know, doing everything they possibly can to ensure that as large an audience is, is made aware of, of, the, of the film. There are also marketing groups, um, independent companies who you can pay, and I highly recommend uh, saving a budget for marketing of the distribution of the film uh, for, for just that. Can also, just, can I just add that it is frustrating? I mean, I my whole model is driving because of my own frustration. But it's also, I think we have to think about the timeline. It's not like, you know, you're gonna release a film and try to get your money out right away. It's, it's over a longer period of time. And you, it does take a village, as Eric is saying, and it takes coordination, and it takes, you know, I believe in short windows, small windows, but, and I believe in getting it up there everywhere. We do, we actually make original content and we do a lot of um, offline screenings throughout the world. And I will say offline screenings, whether it's in a, coffee shop, not a bar, I don't recommend a bar because people never pay attention, um, but bars, libraries, museums, we're now actually utilizing our relationship with the libraries around the world to offer them screenings, free screenings, so that you get butts and seats, you get people tweeting, so that it's, you, you have your social coming from other places than just you, you and your team and the hired staff. We also have an affiliate program, which we, a code can go to every single person who's involved with the movie, not just the cast, but the dolly grip, the, the person who coordinates the extras, the person who, so that they actually can promote the film and if someone actually signs up, they get um, some sort of a bounty for it. So there's all kinds of creative ways, but it takes time and it takes coordination. We had one film that we put up on Hulu for two weeks, just as some promotion to raise awareness for some school, school screenings we were doing. It was a little $4,000 movie and I think we did about $14,000 in uh, business on who just for two weeks of play. That's nice margin. And that was our doing the four thousand dollar film business. Well, no, but our marketing right, but right. it went on to do better. And the marketing, um, I will say that the marketing budget was sixty five dollars for one of those third low end press releases. The rest was pure social. Yolanda. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're an independent uh, distributor, so clearly we don't have the P and A of major, and you're not putting out you know thirty fifty million dollars to theatrically release which is basically marketing and to create the awareness so that when it does go through the ancillary, people are aware of the title and it's easier to discover and so forth. So we're not in that business, but we do put many of our titles through a day and date release. To your point, compressing windows behaves like creating, uh, amping up your marketing spend. So you'll spend less, but you get a greater bang for your buck. In addition to PR, um, which is, you know, we say porn, person's um, marketing spend, and those are very effective events, even festival um, showings, I don't, it doesn't matter how small it is, it creates awareness. So all of those things are an effective way we have seen um, 
you know, great results along with the social media that I mentioned earlier, where we saw it um, increase our VOD. So the whole day and day is to get transactional uh, revenue as high as possible and create that ubiquity and, and awareness. And through that social media group, the director, through the talent, with the right messaging and the links, um, we saw it increase threefold from baseline without any of that, those tactics. Any, have you got any sort of um, hopeful uh, stories of success um, similar to Shiro's that you would mind sharing? Um, just recently, we, we saw that with Final Girl, is the one I'm just talking about. Um, Abigail Breslin and also uh, Tyler Shields, who's the director, had a great relationship with his cast and his crew and was able to keep stimulating that leading up to the release. And um, it's early days, but we've seen great um, performance. And the budget of that film might have been in the the marketing budget? No, or? the actual production budget. Uh, Any guess? Six million dollars. Okay. So that's a kind of a good mid-level film, and you're, you guys are on track for uh, yeah, yeah, successful Yeah, we're hitting all stuff. of our, our performance measurements. Great. Yeah. Michael? I mean, specifically the question, marketing's crucial. I think I've got 18 employees and five devoted to marketing, so we think pretty highly of marketing. Um, yeah. Is it a full court press on every single film of 300 we distribute? No, we just can't do that. But you know, it depends on the film, it depends on the level of uh, investment that Gravitas has in the film, it depends on what we've committed to spend in P&A and what we've committed to do. But it, it's, it's very important and uh, you have to hustle and, and, and get people out there. I mean, you know, putting people on TV shows is, is you can either do it in-house in or we hire an outside PR firm. Um, but you know, and we're actually, in, there's two films this year that we're going to release, it's kind of a departure for us. We've been doing all of our theatricals mostly day and date, and we're going to, you know, try a traditional theatrical. It's, it's a little risky because it's a lot more expensive, but we believe these two documentaries in particular need to roll out that way, and we think we'll actually make more money, you know, at a lower price point down the road after the great reviews come in. So, um, it's, you know, everything's cyclical. Everything was day and date, and now things are starting to go back to traditional theatrical, which requires a lot more tastemaker screens, et cetera. Right. Every, every film is a, is a minor business that you deploy a business plan unique yeah. to that film for every I mean, we business. just picked up a, a documentary. It was a, we were in competition with several other distributors. I know we didn't have the, the highest offering, but I was told we got the film because of a 30-page marketing deck that we put together right. ahead of time, which was not an insignificant work. And Nancy Sanchez and my team did it, and I'll give her Props right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a fantastic deck, and it's yeah. really a meaty thing that we can get involved in. So we're excited about it. Yeah, passion in, in the distribution world. I mean, it's not. It, yes, it's a business, but ultimately the distributors that are out there have particular you know angles that they're really good at. And as filmmakers, you know, you should all be very aware of who does what well and understand how that fits into whatever it is you're producing. Um, you know, if it's art house, if it's uh, documentary each you know we're not all distributors of you know everything we have a particular specialty um, you, you know even if it does look like some of it is volume um, a lot of these companies have been around a long time so they've all shifted I think Sheila's probably got lots of stuff that she was you know engaged in eight, eight years ago it's still available but might you might be engaged in something Watch totally different up. yeah <laughs> but you know I would pick too that once you're building your community um, your recommendation engines become more and more important, um, especially as, as loyalty grows. Well, the peer-to-peer -peer curation is really exciting. But my, Mark, what Michael was saying is marketing is just, that's key. the key yeah. to everything. I almost tell people, don't even make a movie if you don't have some sort of marketing strategy. Right. It can change, it can evolve, you can trash that and get a new one, but you've got to have that before you even start shooting, before you, like, when you come up with the idea. Good. I had a question. There was one gentleman in the back. Do you still have your question? Because yeah. I caught your eye first. Yeah, I was wondering. Um, it seems to me that you know you need to do relationships, such as you know making sure that you have the right merchandising, having all the right platforms, uh, kind of be aware of your film, doing the trailer, doing the poster, and you know I was at a distribution company uh, earlier. I just think the, the, the missing element is more than tailor made marketing strategy that is much more consumer driven than it is uh, business to business. I just think it's an opportunity for, I mean, how many aggregators can there be? And at what point does the proliferation of podcasting and the proliferation of number of aggregators 
It's, I guess it's a fair question. Are, we, are there too many outlets out there for, for us as distributors slash aggregators to do our job effectively? No, I mean, yeah. yes and no. I mean, we have a library of 3,000 films probably now, and they're not on every single platform out there. I mean, and we get approached probably almost weekly now with a new platform that wants to license our films. The first question I ask them is, what major studios do you have? And the answer to that is no, none. The next question I say is, how much money are you going to pay? Because the reality is, if we spend our time delivering these films to unknown platforms, I'm not doing, not, not really being effective in my job. There's only so, so many hours in the day. And you know, that marketing plan that we put together, that is helpful for me to take that plan to the B2B side. Because then I'm going, you know, look, a film that shows up in the right category can do 20 times the business. And so that's, keep your eye on the prize as opposed to saying, yeah, let's, you know, play nice to everyone. I mean, you know, we're trying for-profit entity, and we're trying to make money and make our filmmakers money. So, um, anyone else want to comment on that? Well, I'll the gentleman's last comment. No, we had a question right here. Gentleman in the hat. Uh, Fancy hat. Uh, I like that. Hat. Thanks. Thank you. My name is David. I'm a stand-up comedian and a filmmaker from South Africa. And uh, I ask this question every now and then. Uh, I don't know if you're tracking your platforms or the performance in Africa. And uh, does it matter what uh, what the cast in your movies look like? You know, are the so-called black films or African films performing, not performing? Do you have the? <coughs> and also, have you just looked at Africa as uh, an outlet for what you're trying to do? So, for instance, from being a stand-up comedian, I've started doing shows in areas where, primarily during apartheid, there were no cinemas. So there's only maybe about hundred screens in South Africa. Most films will come out on 40 screens in a population of 50 million people. So there's about 40 million people who the chance that they've never ever been to a cinema. So, but now what's starting to happen is the major distributors and studios are literally just starting to build digital platforms. Because then if I can do it, but it means I'm doing it at my level, you know, I have some money from a gig, I'll make the movie, pay for it myself, it's a low budget, then I start the platform. So I'm wondering also if you would consider, or maybe I think you should consider maybe partnering or starting something, because you have the technology, you have a bit more muscle, and you are independent. As compared to what's happening now, really, whether it's multi-choice or stack, you know, kind of times media, they're really just taking everything that's already on TV, that they already own, when they commission it, they own it 100%, and they're just putting it on a VOD. So just uh, a thought, uh, maybe actually, something to think about. We just signed a, uh, a film school there, and we're screening actually one of our original content films there. And we're uh, getting more and more local content so that we can have some more meaningful programming there. So we actually, because my uh, one of my marketing people had to move there, her husband works for the Gates Foundation, so she moved there for five months. So she's on the boots on the ground, right meeting the filmmakers, talking to the libraries, meet, like, and, and the festivals, and just getting us there in Rwanda. Do you guys break down your user um, <laughs> analytics, re, you know, geography, and, and take advantage of those opportunities? Everything. We are, well, we're actually building out a new user experience that's going to have much deeper analytics so that we'll be able to tell in a couple of weeks if someone's going to actually be a subscriber. and. And, and we're going to share as much of that that makes sense with the filmmakers, yeah. um, so that they can once that once a person's actually on, so that they can learn about their audience. Now we're we know that 90% of our users watch Netflix, and the user behavior is if they watch Netflix and then they come to IndieFlix, they know that we are additive. We're not in competition with Netflix. We're I mean, we're learning. We're that's all we do is study our user behavior. They're lifestyle connoisseurs. They skew large, you know, more older, but the 18 to 24 year old mark, male market is growing because they're out there making movies. We need more women out there making movies. And they're bringing their audience because they're smart, they're savvy, they can do everything in house. And they're making great stories. They're telling great stories. Awesome. Michael, does your Nancy Sanchez and your staff spend some time and try to look at those opportun opportunities as well internationally? I mean, absolutely. That's really where, so we're in, in Los Angeles and, and in Cleveland, Ohio, which if you didn't know, is the entertainment capital of the Midwest. <laughs> uh, there's four of us in Cleveland, and really it's our international team. Um, but I firmly believe that's where distribution is going. And um, we've done a number of these now, kind of day and day global releases, 
twenty five languages across the world. Tell your community my film is now available on demand worldwide um, for the global customers, whether it's Apple or Google or Microsoft or to a lesser extent Amazon, to be able to tell their marketing department, hey, here's a great piece of content you can tout throughout your whole uh, infrastructure that's available. Um, it reduces piracy and so yes, I mean, and you know, South Africa in particular is interesting. South Africa is a tough country, even though it's English language, because you have to get a rating. And so most independent films that are released in the U.S. are not rated because it's expensive to go get a rating from MPAA. And once you get a rating, you've got to make sure that the artwork's rated, the trailers, and things like that. And so it's really a hassle. And we haven't seen that rated movies perform necessarily better than not rated or just like a TV rating. But you know, South Africa, and so it's a thousand bucks or something like that. It's something to take into consideration, you know, in the whole panoply of, of where am I going. Um, it's not the only territory where you, you know, when you start thinking globally, it, it's difficult because you have to start thinking about localization and are subtitles sufficient or is it going to require dubs? And if it's dubs, do I have enough uh, sales in the territory that warrants a thirty thousand dollar German dub? Yeah. Um, so. But I do, I do absolutely think it's the future. Those are practical things to keep in mind as everybody's putting their budgets together. Yolanda, uh, Cinedyne is worldwide, correct? We are a North American distri distribution company. However, we do rely on our um, global digital accounts to reach the rest of the world. And so I can tell you what you know what our customers tell us. Um, Netflix, for example, um, is uh, curating local content, looking for that local content into in order to be more authentic to that end user. Um, just licensing worldwide rights even from us across those territories isn't enough. Um, so they, they need to be relevant. Um, I can also tell you that my experience with urban content, black content in the States, um, we were the distributor for Code Black. We brought um, Cat Williams and um, Kevin Hart. Yeah. And Kevin Hart was the most amazing marketing machine. He activated, he pulled every lever, every social media, and he made um, our jobs much easier. Um, and he was able to, I mean, he's talented, but in addition, he, he increased his awareness by his own making um, and was able to you know, be who he is today. Yeah. Uh, young lady in the back there. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm currently producing a web series that has a really large ensemble cast. And so we've had a social media plan in place right from the beginning. Um, and what you said earlier that I wanted to know more about was the right messaging when marketing on social media. Obviously, it's probably unique to each project, but could you <coughs> shed a little more light on what would be right or maybe more appropriately, what would be the wrong messaging? Um, you want to go ahead, no, please. Well, I just, the wrong message, this happened to us before, um, is when um, the wrong you know, release dates where it's being, <laughs> where you can find it, and that's not good. <laughs> so directing someone to the wrong place, and they're now even more frustrated. Make them work for it. People get distracted, <laughs> right? And then they're not watching us. So we need to really provide the that you know we absolutely want the passion of talent to come through, but with the last piece of um, direction of how to you know, through a link make it easy again convenience and accessibility. And, um, and also what's really, you know, we speak, we spend some time with filmmakers understanding their objectives. We have a documentary, A Brave Heart, which is a Lizzie Velasquez um, story on anti-bullying. And she's an activist. She's the most amazing human who was bullied on YouTube. I don't know if you guys have heard the story, but as the ugliest woman in the world. And she, rather than hiding, has come out and is um, pushing for um, the first anti-bullying federal um, law. So their first um, objective is to get the message across every um, person and team specifically um, and then hope the second is to get the law uh, or the bill passed um, so we know that those are the two objectives and so every piece of communication and marketing tactic is geared to give that the greatest success Eric you want to help yeah, I mean, once a film is released, I think it's important to click to actually do something. Uh, anytime you drive a consumer from a social environment to somewhere, be thoughtful about where it is you're taking them in terms of the, uh, the ability to do something. Where is it in a theater near me? Where uh, can I purchase? Uh, where is the website? Where is extra uh, content, right? Depending on what your goal is, 
uh, to, to bring them. You know, I always say uh, in any sort of social involvement, um, get an interactivity going. I find all too often on Facebook or, or Twitter, um, it's, it's um, push communication, and suddenly a consumer is like, well, okay, here's information. But what you really want is them to do something, right? <clears throat> and it could be even voting, you know, which actor is better, this one or that one? Which film is better, this one or that one? Um, get them talking, get them engaged. The more you can get them engaged, or actually going somewhere to engage in uh, your media, the better. I think we can take one more question before I go to the old wrap up, because I know they need the room in seven minutes. Thank you all for coming and sharing your expertise. Thank you for coming. It's our pleasure. Um, very interesting thoughts on how to win on digital distribution. But let's say your movie, for some reason, does not. Does that mean it's doomed, or is there a second life? And can you talk about how do you revitalize a movie that didn't reach its audience on the first run? Well, why don't we wrap that up? Let's go across and kind of deal with you know, uh, failures becoming successes. Anything like that? And there's always, I mean, so the, then the, library, the film essentially goes new release to some, at some point of library film, right? Or catalog film. And there's great opportunities to promote catalog. There's great opportunities to do 99 cent rentals or, or discounted EST prices, um, depending on the type of film thematically. Um, Valentine's Day stunts, Easter stunts, Halloween stunts. Uh, or when you have 3,000 films, we try and create our own stunts and go and say, hey, wouldn't it be interesting to do a quick little stunt on um, environmental documentaries? And you can bring in our 30 different environmental documentaries, one week only, they're for sale. And so we help our partners, and we're help, by helping them, we're helping ourselves and our filmmakers because we're coming up with some marketing ideas or you know, a tray on, on Hulu. Um, you don't always get it, but you have to think about um, programming and, and making their job easier too. And just everybody, as you answer, can you just give the filmmakers uh, an idea of when they can approach you? If they're in the midst of the budgeting process or they want to make their project, you know, put it into your bailiwick or level of understanding, does it need to be finished? So, is there a development um, way to approach you guys to at least get some feedback as they're putting budgets together? Uh, and, and then answer, let's answer uh, this gentleman's question again, too. So, Michael, just follow up. Um, yeah. As to when for Gravitas, it's a finished film, and uh, you can go to gravitasventures.com. All of our email addresses and phone numbers. So, for original content, I mean, for if you're looking for funding, then you go to the Indie Books Foundation. It's a completely separate entity, but that's where we actually um, we are funding content now. Only social justice content, and it can be anything. In fact, we're launching a virtual reality project that's actually going to then launch a virtual reality channel on IndieFlix next year, which is really exciting. Um, and then as far as your question with regard to, you no, know, it's never over. You know, the person in your film might go out and win an Oscar, then suddenly you've got something on your hands. You know, if it's a feature, I don't know what it is. I'm of the belief that, you know, like every child has their own journey and every film is like a child. And I think that, you know, you have to sort of Look at it, break it down, like Eric was saying, like find all the little niche sort of uh, audience, audiences, platforms, communities, places that you can tap into. Our audience, we've learned, they're not looking for like the hottest thing that just came off the press. They're looking for a great story. They're looking to immerse themselves <coughs> in something because they've got their playing was delayed and they've got 40 minutes because we have a lot of uh, people watch from their handheld devices and, and, and computers and or, uh, iPads. So. It's not over until it's over, until you give up, until you say it's over. So I would just, don't think like that. The time is longer. This is your child. It's growing up and it's going to take shape and it's going to become a body of your work. Maybe what you should do is make another movie that's really good. I'm not saying the first one wasn't, but it might have missed a window of some sort. And that will get so much, you know, heat. That'll, everyone will want to see your early work as well. So that's one way to look at it. Yolanda? Oh, Just can I say one thing? Yeah. I'm putting this, I have information for anyone that I'm going to put right here, which gives you a little info on indie flights. Great. It'll have to be in the outside of the room, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've done these things before. I know how uh, this yeah, whole thing operates. Sure.
So your, your question about, you know, year release versus its catalog life, and even if it didn't perform where you wanted to on year release, um, just to quantify it, 50% of our revenue is from catalog. So we don't rely on just the new releases coming out. We can't, um, you know, we would miss um, all that uh, margin. So, you know, we are constantly looking at how do we revitalize, re-promote our catalog, our library across wherever it's living. And through what Michael said, through the stunts, through, um, but also not only are we coming up with the ideas, because we have enough content where we're able to group things together and thematically present it back and make it really easy for the account to accept it. But we also task them because they do, they have promotional calendars. Um, so at CES, we're there, we ask for the full year promotional calendars. We slot ourselves in and say, okay, we've got great um, films on um, social justice or great films on um, uh, female uh, in jeopardy or whatever it may be, sci-fi, we, we create um, not just to fit into their promotions, but we create our own ideas um, in order to keep that catalog relevant. And it, and, and it could be because your talent is in something else. Um, so so it, it is really important. Um, it really it pays our bills. Um, and how do we take um, the life cycle? So we do traditionally look at completed films, but we're happy to do some pre-buys based on cast, genre, and script. Thank you. Eric, you get the last word. Awesome. Um, First and last word. Yeah, I see that. Um, the technology over the next few years, discovery tools has a long way to go. I think we're just begun to scratch the surface of discovery tools. The reason I bring that up is currently there's just a mess of content. There's not a whole lot of relevance. Uh, yesterday's panel, I mentioned how Amazon, you buy one thing from Amazon and suddenly it shows you for the rest of your life that you know those things are relevant to you. It's going to become a more personalized environment, and therefore, there is a long tail. And what I mean by that is, your title may be up there. It may have performed a new release, may or may not have been to your, uh, your liking, uh, but it lives on in the digital store shelf. And as uh, these services, these global services, turn on new territories, uh, and you have more generationally, more consumers moving into those uh, those store, uh, those digital stores, um, you've got more consumers, uh, and they are starting to find the content that, that they're interested in. A few years ago, Netflix was, you know, neck deep in DVDs, and we would ask them, how many of these 150,000 titles turn each month? As in, how many times does one of those film discs show up in somebody's home? The answer was 100% because they have good discovery tools, and someone, somewhere along the way, in the millions of subs, are actually viewing that content, and want to view that content, and are discovering that content. So as the discovery tools get better, uh, I think there are gonna be increased opportunities for some of these titles that sort of lay, you know, not in the top tier, but middle and lower, they're gonna find an audience. Thank you oh, very much. And you can, yes. pro you can approach me. Yes, you can approach me anytime. There you go. Oh. All of our bios are in the uh, industry um, uh, pamphlet online as well. And uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, a great panel. Thank you so much. Do you have just a 15 minute turnover for the next session? And everyone who's going to participate in that session will need to get re scanned at the lobby doors. So if you have questions for the panelists or if you'd like to chat, please go out into the lobby and you'll, they'll be out to answer your questions. I'll put your documents and uh, any stuff on my table. Thank you. 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 Thank you.